Ruler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get singles for all your Force of Will and other trading card games, as well as these amazing patrons. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the video. Hey there, Rulers. DMO73 here, bringing you a feature match for the week between myself and Paul. Once again, Paul is playing a red-black Isis moon list uh, featuring heroic epic and some other cool combos. And I am playing a um, pretty much mono blue splash black uh, perfect Loki list um, that was designed by Josh Borsma. It is kind of a dredge style list, kind of focused on this idea of you could also kind of carve it call it the beginnings of like harvest loki where you kind of try to flood the grave flip over a uh, perfect loki and then just abuse the fact that you can cast a card out of your graveyard every single turn even if you don't just automatically win with giants so with that we're going to go ahead and jump right in here um i am going to be going on the draw which is not particularly bad especially if the deck sees uh shadow of chronos in the beginning because then you can use your energize for shadow of chronos and then have an immediate uh wa water darkness source to use for like a discard spell or, or something like that so we'll have to see how this goes The red black list is is definitely a more aggressive version of the Isis list. I mean, it is technically having white um, because it needs to be able to play Nyarlathotep, but at its base core, it is a red black because we're playing the heroic epic, which is a little bit more of an important card. You see, he already has it there in hand, as well as having Surter. Um, Surter is really great in this idea because when it enters with heroic epic, it's going to generate two moons and serves a removal spell and then be able to swing in for eighteen. It's it's a lot um, to push out for just three will. And then it comes back into your hand, so then you still have the ability to generate even more moons later with it. So first turn Dragon Ore, and then we see the Desert Miner, so immediately being able to play Red White. Dragon Ore is a stone that matters. Uh, it is treated as a fire magic stone, so Desert Miner lets you use it. First turn Shadow of Kronos into a Look of Corruption here. Um, we see the Isis and we immediately get rid of it. Turns out it looks like he didn't have the Heroic Epic after all. Um, we don't really care about the Surters. We do care about the Isis. We want to disrupt that play as much as possible. Uh, and we're not too concerned about Shadow of Kronos. Thankfully, he has Barrier. A big trick that early game Isis players are liking to do now is um, during the upkeep Poison Stinger into Spiral of Chaos for a ton of damage. Thankfully, that can't affect Shadow of Kronos because of the fact that he has Barrier, which is really, really nice. Looks like he drew into a shoe over on Paul's side. Not bad ramp since I discarded for him. Just going to go ahead and swing in for four. I say that's fine. I'll go down to 36. Down comes the shoe, so now he has access to be able to ramp using that Isis that I made him discard. Uh, and I'm going to use Shadow of Kronos before I draw to kind of see if the card I would be drawing is one that I don't really care about. And if I don't, then I would ship it to Graveyard for Perfect Loki to be able to use later. Calling Stone on my turn, um, you saw I shipped the Arthur there. It's mainly just a cantripping resonator um, that we can just repeatedly cast over and over and over again uh, with Perfect Loki. Um, so... Having the two will open here. Playing Freed from the Altar to go down to 32. This is to go grab a perfect Loki, trying to set up for potential next turn flip. And then leaving one open up for either choose to discard here or if I have something like a Keys' Call or something like that. For if I'm concerned about there being Isis coming into play. Um, it's going to go ahead and use Godly Aura here in the end of my turn. It generates him a moon and draws him a card. An excellent addition um, to this deck. A little bit of more draw power as well as some free generation of moons um, before Isis hits the field. So then you kind of have better ways to be able to protect her um, in response to her uh, enter effect if someone tries to kill her there. See, so he has that mind like still water in hand kind of using for that kind of thing. Drew into a heroic epic here and did hit Nullstone off the top. So pretty unfortunate for me that we're probably going to see some um, one of those surters pop into play. Quickly going to just swing in for four to start with. Take me down to 28. 
and then down comes the heroic epic most likely going to be flashing in the surter here because it will generate a couple extra moons don't have a response unfortunately to the casting flashing in the surter uh, in response to the attempting to um, I'm trying to determine exactly what he's trying to do here so he has to target um, so surter has to target something he's going to target the desert miner in response to surter trying to target the desert miner he's going to banish the desert miner to generate a moon um, I'm making sure that resolves first and then before surter's thing goes off I'm gonna go ahead and keys call it so he doesn't get two additional moons so he does get to kill the desert the desert miner banishes to its own effect he doesn't get the surter effect but at this point in time surter still gets to swing in for 18 so taking me down to 10 because he does have natural swiftness all by himself and then bounces back to hand at the end of turn so already not a good place for this perfect loki deck to be it is um already pretty far behind and against a red deck that can easily explode out damage uh, i have to be very very careful here even playing a single resonator that doesn't have barrier is a little bit of a risk purely because of the um with the amount of damage that I've taken purely because of the poison stinger situation that we talked about before. And that is kind of the thing that you have to do against Perfect Loki. You have to force them to um, be in a position where flipping feels uncomfortable, where they don't get as much value out of it, where they tap out and then kind of leave themselves vulnerable for a turn. Um, and, and hope that you don't see multiple Fenrirs. I mean, that is the risk when a Loki flips, um, that you'll see the Fenrirs up here um, come into play off of the, the mill 10. Ultimately deciding that I need to just go ahead and do it. So we're going to banish a Fenrir from hand to produce the black, flip over Loki, and then we're going to play the perfect Loki from the hand to become our new J ruler. Get to mill 10 here. Now it is worth notice knowing, um, it is worth mentioning here that there is a response to this trigger and he did technically have a way to produce will. So if he had a way before the mill effect happened to deep pay one will to generate, um, uh, pay one will to do some kind of thing that would kill the perfect Loki um, before the cards went to grave, then it probably would actually just be game because at that point in time, I would be tapped out. Um, perfect Loki wouldn't be on the field. I'd have a shadow of Kronos and the Fenrirs would just go back to hand at that point because perfect Loki isn't in the field. Um, that is one of the things that you have to kind of be really careful for when you're flipping early as perfect Loki is that if they might have any kind of response to be able to um, finish me off that way. So here we're going to go ahead and see um, the Poison Stinger thing, and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh wait, I start to scoop it up, and then we go, oh wait a minute, that only leaves me a down to two damage um, because of the uh, Spiral and Perfect Loki, uh, sorry, the Fenrir being a 12-12. Um, so I am at two life left against a burn deck, um, which is probably just should be game at this point, really. Ultimately, though, it doesn't look like he has something in hand to be able to finish me off, which gives me a little bit of an opportunity um, potentially here. Choosing not to use the Shadow of Kronos ability, which I probably should have done uh, at the end of his turn. Um, we're going to go ahead and try it again post-recovery. Um, and we're not even going to worry. Or we, or we attack with per perfect Kronos, or Kronos to take him down to 36. And we're going to use that two remaining will here uh, to cast Neo Ragnarok. So the reason why we're swinging um, with the Kronos first is because we absolutely, absolutely need to have something that's rested um, so that Angra Boda can um, kill something. If I had called for stone, then she would have had to target, um, then she would have had to target the uh, perfect Loki, which would have been really bad. Um, so now we're just gonna kill our Shadow of Kronos uh, and generate a thousand life. And then we unfortunately have to pay four life for Utgard, um, but we do get all of these golems. We get to go get a new Shadow of Kronos off the top with um, and ramp a stone with, um, the green giant trowel will generate a couple of moons, uh, which don't really which we don't really mind. Uh, and then um, 
we can have a potential here with Belgamir to hit it to a couple more uh, Fenrirs, because if we hit Fenrirs off the top, um, we could just mill them and have them come straight into the field. Ultimately, we made a mistake here, and we didn't resolve Trow first. We absolutely should have resolved Trow first, just to thin the deck as much as possible. The sequencing here was was incorrect. Um, getting the Kronos out of the way um, into hand would have caused a shuffle, potentially giving us one thinner card to potentially see another Fenrir here. And that would have been really good if we had seen one or two Fenrirs off the of Belgamir. Then we would have had to cheat that into play, and we would have had a flyer, and we would have felt a lot more comfortable. Ultimately here, though, we just have a big body of boards with no flyers, and you see there is a pig in his hand. Um, which is not good for us. <laughs> and that's, you know, Calling Stone here as well, um, purely because we, we need to have something to be able to deal with his t on his turn, um, potentially, especially since we can recast um, Keys' Call if we need to from the Graveyard because of Perfect Loki. Um, so, and then we can just swing in for 18, and then we have this big board of giants, uh, and then hopefully just seeing if we can try to save ourselves from being killed. So he plays the pig here, and I'm like, okay, cool. Let me think about how many strength counters he has. He has to be able to give it swiftness and flying. Um, he can't give them both swiftness and flying. I think he, at this point in time, had six counters. Um, he would be going up to eight. Um, so I would want to stop him from going up to eight. So I'm going to go ahead and keys call the trigger to gain two counters, leaving him at six. So we can't give both swiftness and flying. So at that point in time, we feel comfortable, right? Because we want to be able to block at least one of them. He's going to give pig swiftness and flying. Swing in for five, which I can't stop. So I go down to three. And then well-chosen rune in the rune deck, the Contract Forge in Sands. He can sacrifice the Desert Miner, recover the pig. As we go into uh, the next game, don't forget again. to hit that subscribe and so button and getting the bell the down below and taking so you're notified when all of our videos go live. And consider supporting the channel by being a member here on YouTube or by checking it out on Patreon for all the cool exclusive perks that come with supporting us. Thank you guys so much. Let's go to the next game. So game two here, choosing to take the play as the perfect Loki. Trying things a little bit differently, maybe hoping that I can get a little bit of a stronger start. First turn, Shadow of Kronos feels very good since all of the stones in this deck are blue. You want to be able to access black. You see we see an Ushua and an Epic Stories there. He's going to hurt himself too to play the Desert Miner, and now both of us kind of have access to whatever colors we need. After draw, choosing to use the Shadow of Kronos rather than doing it before, or no, sorry, before draw, Shadow of Kronos, to so then draw a card. It just helps us to kind of peek whichever ones we want. Um, thought control here coming down. We see an Isis. We're not really worried about the Isis right now. Um, if you were playing in the sideboard of this deck, we were, for the sake of this, Paul didn't have a sideboard, so we weren't sideboarding. There is Glint of Insight, three copies in the sideboard for this deck. That would have been an excellent time to just cast it. Um, we would have stolen both Isis and left him with just a mind like still water, a Surter, and an Ushua, which we feel very comfortable with because it's going to be at least two turns before he can cast it, especially now that we've taken the Heroic Epic. Gonna take the four damage here from Paul, uh, and then he's just going to burn himself two um, and try burn his Energize to try to play an Isis. And we have the Keys' Call, which we were prepared for that as well. Um, so we stop him from being able to search. Again, that would have been significantly less of a problem um, if we had had the Glint of Insight. But at that point in time, we also risk him um, hitting. Well, having taken the Heroic Epic, we're a little bit less concerned about the uh, Ushua coming in. So we're just going to go ahead and just turbo flip right here right now. The pressure is on. He's burned his Energize at maximum. He gets a heroic epic here. We're feeling pretty good. We're probably going to hit at least one Fenrir most likely. Um, getting to bring another card back into our hand. Next turn we can Neo Ragnarok and do all kinds of stuff. So feeling pretty good with the fact that Paul is on the back foot here. Um, and we stopped the Isis. So we stopped some of the ramp. Did draw into another heroic epic here after paying, hurting himself, uh, having to hurt himself. Um, he's going to shoot the perf the perfect Fenrir, which is a little interesting. And only he's going to do 12. So I think at this point in time, there was no way for him to kill the perfect Loki. So I think shooting the Fenrir makes sense. It gets rid of the flyer. Um, and then I could potentially even, you know, 
I'm just gonna take the 18. Um, in response to the swing, though, we're gonna try to use Shadow of Kratos, maybe hit another Fenrir to cheat it in, um, so we can maybe steal and kill the Surtur. Ultimately, though, we're fine with just taking the 18, um, because once again, we're probably gonna just be doing Neil Ragnarok next turn, and we feel pretty comfortable about it. Um, <clears throat> calling Stone here. Casting Neo Ragnarok and responding to it with the Kronos so that we have potentially hitting another Fenrir again was the kind of hope here. Um, but again, we don't have to worry about killing our own J Ruler with Angravoda. Doing the sequencing properly this time, we're going to shoot all of the things at uh, Kronos, so it's going to die. Trow is going to resolve first, so we get to go get another Shadow of Kronos. Belgamir is going to mill us four. Hopefully, Belgamir in those four sees at least one Fenrir, and then that Fenrir gets to cheat into the board. So we have not only this big wave of flyers, not only did we swing in for 18 damage, but also we have then this um, flying blocker uh, to potentially not have a repeat of last turn. Get to gain a thousand because of Angra Boda. Cert guard, um, Utgard Loki is going to make us lose four. He has to choose to discard a card. And then we're resolving Belgamir last to hopefully see if we can get into another um, Fenrir. Doesn't look like we saw one there. So at that point in time, it's just we're just going to mill all four at that point. We still have to draw a card off of it. Unfortunately, the card that we drew was another Fenrir, so that's a little unfortunate, um, but it does just buff up the defense of our perfect Loki significantly, and then we'll swing in for another 18 um, to take him down to 16. So a nice little life point swing here, feeling pretty comfortable that we're not going to get a crackback lethal like we were before, uh, and at that point in time, it's probably going to be pushed through for game, um, but he does happen to have... Um, looks like a potential another perfect look another heroic epic with an ushua on board um he does have to worry about walking into the keys call skull though um because perfect loki again can be able to cast um one card per turn from the graveyard uh, and it just goes back to the grave so right now perfect loki looks like he has 20 defense because i have 19 cards in grave we're going to play an isis I say, you know what, Isis is fine. I'm not gonna worry about um, keys calling that. Uh, you already have three um, moons. You'd be going to five moons total. Um, I'm less concerned about that being able to come into play this turn than I am anything else. So I say that's fine. You can go search for a Nyarlathotep if you would like, uh, and then generate a moon. And then I'll just save the keys as call for whatever you're thinking about doing um, with that nine extra or that five will that you currently have sitting up thanks to those four moons and the um, null stone. Using those stones to play the heroic epic. I imagine that means we're probably going to be bringing in an Ushua here. That's definitely going to get keys is called um, because now he can only play one other card here. And if he wants to play uh, Isis, he can, or sorry, Narlathotep, he can, but um, Narl can't target any of the giants because they can't be targeted by anything that costs four or less. So her pitch um, moons to burn effect doesn't do anything to the giants. So at that point in time, I would have this wall of blockers. There's no way he's going to be able to stop it. Um, and then the crackback would most definitely be lethal. Not to mention the fact that if there's a perfect Loki in the graveyard or in my hand, I could just cast it, wipe the board, and then go in. Paul kind of deliberating about whether or not he can do anything here. Um, seeing if there's any kind of option. 
way to potentially get around all these giants. Ultimately just tries to maybe draw into a better option, seeing if he can maybe draw into a pig. Um, draws into a sprinting time horse, which isn't going to get him there. And so at that point in time, he's going to go ahead and say, no, scoop it up, and we'll push into game three. So game three, Paul back on the play. Um, perfect Loki, Dredge being back on the draw. Um, it's trying to see if we can get similar starts, only this time for me not taking as much damage in the early game, because um, as it seemed to be, the early flip wasn't super... Um, devastating provided my life total is high enough um so i just have to be a little bit more cautious and and not necessarily flip if my life totals are good and just pick maybe pick my discards a little bit better paying one here ultimately having nothing on turn one which is a little bit disappointing for him um we do have the turn one chronos into thought control looking at the hand we see double um Double Surters, uh, Mind Life Still Water, which isn't super relevant. Um, I start to take a look at the Godly Aura, but I also start to look to potentially stop him from ramping moons. Ultimately, though, I decide to take the Pig here. My idea was the reason why I lost game one is because I took too much damage too early. So getting the Pig out of the hand with stuff that's in the hand isn't going to lend itself to me taking a ton of damage, at least in the next couple turns. Um, potentially, I mean, there's not any damage represented there in the next turn, which gives me the chance to potentially discard and, and deal with that. Godly Aura from the hand, or from the Rune deck in upkeep, generating a moon, drawing a card. Calling Stone, another Dragon Ore, generating him some strength counters. You see we now have double Ushua in hand as well. Um, another Thought Control. We're going to see a Godly Aura get cast in response to that. Unfortunately, though, the card that he draws is the Heroic Epic, um, so we're just going to immediately choose that as our discard um, and just say, nope, we're going to lock you out of that. We are sitting on a Keezus Call as well, I think, at this point, um, or it's an Erendite there. So if he does play the Isis on turn three, we feel pretty comfortable stopping that. Choosing to pass as well there. Choosing not to use the Kronos here, which I think is um, a misplay. I mean, there's no real reason to not use Kronos during the upkeep just to shape your hand a little bit better in terms of draw. Um, it's also getting stuff to the graveyard for Perfect Loki to be able to use in a later date, making Perfect Loki just a little bit more defense, having a little bit more defense on imme immediately upon flip. Um, another pass from Paul at the end of that turn, it looks like, with all those cards. Um, just kind of showing off the hand a little bit. Um, Paul and I just kind of having a good time. Once again, choosing to miss out on the Kronos effect, we're going to go ahead and use Loki's Insight during the upkeep to just take two of the mine like still waters, um, get the instant speed stuff out of the way, and again, missing now, choosing to use the Kronos, which should have been done before upkeep. Um, doesn't really matter because we, we just ship the card anyway, but it does keep another card in our graveyard for if we want to worry about Perfect Loki. Now, I make a misplay here. I go to flip uh, Perfect Loki, knowing that he has Utgard in hand uh, and having absolutely zero reason to cast it yet. Um, so we're, we're going to go ahead and mill um, to see if we can get some, uh, some Fenris into the field. Thankfully, we get two, uh, and we have this very large graveyard now, but we know that there's Utgard on the field, and we know there's already two moons. Um, so at this point in time, we're going to get burned for a lot. He's going to get to discard one of the Utgards, targeting the perfect Loki. Um, it'll deal 16, and currently, defense-wise, we are not at enough on the perfect Loki to be able to stop it from hitting that. So yes, we did get two Fenrirs, which is great. Ultimately, though, um, we're going to use Kronos, see if we can maybe hit a third not you see i have um an athena's love here 
Athenia's love in the um, discard, that would have been a really good opportunity to potentially use that card if I had just waited a little bit longer uh, when I didn't really need to. Um, so now I have one will available. I just have to deal with what's in my hand. Yes, I have two uh, final form Fenvers on the board, which is nice, um, but I still have to now deal with the fact that I might not have a perfect Loki and a Fenrir in hand because I've now seen three of the four to be able to flip perfect Loki comfortably. Thankfully, I can just use Kronos to produce the black. It just makes things a little bit more awkward. Isis comes down. We're going to go ahead and keys call it, draw into another card. Um, it does leave him up with a ton of extra will, though, uh, and we decided to let that happen. Um, so now we have to deal with the Ushua. Ultimately, his Ushua we didn't cancel, and he hits the Nyarlathotep Nyar anyway. Um, so now we're about to be dealing with a ton of damage and his potential being able to board wipe me back. So... Pretty unfortunate um, kind of play line there. I didn't really necessarily need to do that, especially since I was sitting on Erendite and Keys' call. Um, I could have just called Stone and set up for a, a much safer turn later, as well as having Athenia's love to potentially allow for sacrificing impersonators. It is technically a spot removal spell if we need to. We go to block, um, and then we forget that she has uh, first strike and Bane, so we're like, you know what? Actually, no, we're fine. We're going to take the, the eight damage here, go down to 32. Isis has Swiftness, thanks to both Ushua and herself, because we control the moon, so that's a thousand damage coming in. And he can just choose to burn moons in response to any kind of blocks to make sure the damage goes through. Go to block with the perfect Loki. Our thought is maybe force him to use it. He's going to shoot it once, shoot it twice, force him to burn his moons now so that if we flip um, perfect Loki the following turn, board wipe him back. He kind of set him back will wise. Um, it's kind of the idea. But we're going to take a thousand damage in the process, go down to 22. We're going to block the Ushua, choosing to not burn it out of the way. Um, so just trade with the perfect Fenrir here. No perfect Loki in hand. We do have an Athena's love. Um, the other thing is you see me playing the um, Kronos Envoy. Kronos Envoy is an excellent card uh, once you've flipped perfect Loki because it's essentially pay to will summon perfect Fenrir from deck uh, or final form Fenrir from deck. Um, but ultimately, again, that's more important, um, more relevant when we get to having more stones. This Isis deck is doing a very good job of keeping the perfect Loki deck kind of on the back foot uh, and not being able to comfortably flip um, with a lot of open will left over. Calling stone here. And Athenia's love. Going to go ahead and burn ourselves four from Freed from the Altar here to try to grab a perfect Loki. Now, um, here's the weirdness with this. This perfect Loki is not going to result in us doing a flip. We can't afford that right now because of how low on life we are. So we are going to end up probably we are going to end up using it um, to apply that kind of effect to our opponent's board during his turn to kind of time walk him essentially um, we'd lock him out of the moons being able to produce him well we'd leave him at six will total um and we'd also be pretty comfortable so we're going to go ahead and pass and then before draw on his turn we're going to try to do perfect loki's effect i think it's a minus 16 minus 15 or 16 um, to his board defense wise for the whole turn so now anything he was going to try to play has to have 17 or higher defense or it immediately dies thanks to rules process the idea being here we stall him out we've called stone next turn we would be able to potentially flip in if we have a fenrir um flip into an immediate um 
into an immediate, um, oh, we don't have another perfect Loki again, so that's a little bit less significant. Um, the idea of being able to try to flip into a Neo Ragnarok if we can get into a perfect Loki, but ultimately um, it's not super great. We're going to go ahead and see the Poison Stinger um, play here. He's going to go ahead and say, well, we'll take advantage of it. We'll ping you for three. Um, we're going to respond by trying to get an additional card there just to stop the damage as much as possible. Um, thinking about whether or not we want to keep it. Choosing to ship it to Grave, it is going to be Perfect Predator, which then comes into our hand, which feels great. Um, but we need a Perfect Loki to be able to follow it up with. Um, and then doesn't save us from having to take that three damage because it's 17, I think there were 16 cards in Grave. So 17 defense. So we end up taking three damage from him. Uh, and that's just going to leave him with three for his turn. And then we go to our turn. At this point in time, we have 17 cards in Grave, so um, Asserter, if we can get a Perfect Loki, isn't going to stop Perfect Loki um, from being able to flip because we'll be at 18 defense, um, which feels pretty comfortable. We're playing Guinevere's Investigations. Um, this is the first time you've probably seen this card in a long time. It does get us to draw another card and see our opponent's hand. This card is actually really nice when you get Perfect Loki flipped because if your opponent doesn't do anything or you don't need to use Loki's Graveyard Effect, you just cast it for one, draw a card, it goes back to grave, and then you have perfect knowledge of your opponent's hand for their entire, for your turn. Um, it is a very re useful repeatable spell. See, we have the uh, final form Fenrir, but no perfect Loki, sadly. We do have Athenia's Love, um, which could potentially serve as a sack outlet to if he chooses to play a Resonator. Um, Trying to see what else we might try to do here. I think we might have either found a perfect Loki from hand. Ah, uh, yes, we're going to try to just do a return of God here um, to see if we can maybe hit into a perfect Loki, just to have a big defensive body, um, or maybe just something a little bit more valuable here. Do you see the perfect Loki there? Perfect Loki coming down just to serve as a beat stick. It's not going to kill anything. So the board nag has already been, it'll be done by the end of the turn. Calling another stone um, for the next turn. Try to dig a little deeper. At least at this point in time, we have one more Perfect Loki left in the deck. So they I dig um, through um, to try to draw into it and play a little bit of an offensive game. For upkeep, we're going to see the uh, Surter, and down comes the uh, Athenia's Love. So now we have Eternal for the turn, which is great. So we get to keep a blocker again if he tries to push through. Um, we have some, some nice defensive walls, thankfully, very much. Ultimately, having the Isis, we're going to try to... Uh, Erendite that, stop it from generate him generating any more moons. Um, pay two, we see an Ushua. Or sorry, pay with the moons to get an Ushua. I can't Erendite that. Um, and ultimately hitting another Isis off the top of that, which gets to go dig him something else. And at that point in time, I've tapped out. Um, so that it is actually going to be game because Isis doesn't force you to grab Neurolithotep, it forces you to grab a two drop. So at this point in time, he can just grab Pig. Um, doesn't have to worry about generating a moon. He just grabs Pig, and he has plenty of strength counters to give all of that stuff, to give Ushua flying, and at that point in time, we end the game. So that is the match. Hopefully, you guys really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to play, a ton of really cool interactions. Deck profiles for these lists will be up later this week, along with the Hanzo list from last week. And until next time, this is TMO73 saying, Class Dismissed.